following was made possible by the friends of the Fort Worth Public Library. That it's written in a style that's very like epic poem, which means that characters are defined by what they do, by external action rather than by interiority. Um, the, the reason I did that is because, uh, you know, even though I write a lot of stories that are focused on interiority, I, I didn't feel like that was the right style for a narrative like this. Um, it's sort of like if everybody was doing photorealistic paintings, then uh, doing brush painting and abstract brush painting feels out of place. But for me, I, I like brush painting, and I wanted to do my booking that way. So um, the characters are going to be drawn in a different way. They're closer to the way epic poetry does it than, than a modern novel. So in a lot of ways, my novel reads older um, uh, and as, as well as being newer. Um, anyway, so the first book ends with uh, a new regime being formed under Kunigaru. Uh, and the second uh, book, The Wall of Storms, is, starts a few years after that founding act. And it's about what happens after you win the revolution. Uh, because, um, as everyone knows, the hardest part of a revolution is not winning it, it's keeping it. And uh, uh, I think it's Ursula K. Le Guin who once said that, the children of a revolution are always unsatisfied with it, and the revolution should be grateful that that is so. All right, so from the Wall of Storms. Masters and mistresses, lend me your ears. Let my words sketch for you scenes of faith and courage. Dukes, generals, ministers, and maids, Everyone parades through this ethereal stage. What is the love of a princess? What are a king's fears? If you loosen my tongue with drink and enliven my heart with coin, all will be revealed in due course of time. Now that's, of course, a storyteller, but that is true for all authors as well. Coin <laughs> and drink, very important. <clears throat> The sky was overcast, and the cold wind whipped a few scattered snowflakes through the air. Carriages and pedestrians in thick coats and fur-lined hats hurried through the wide avenues of Pan, the harmonious city, seeking the warmth of home, or the comfort of a homely pub like the three-legged jug. Inside, warm rice wine, Cold beer and coconut arrack flowed as freely as the conversation. The fire in the wood-burning stove in the corner crackled and danced, keeping the pub toasty and bathing everything in a warm light. Condensation froze against the glass windows in refined, complex patterns that blurred the view of the outside. Guests sat by threes and fours around the low tables in Geupa, relaxed and convivial. Enjoying small plates of roasted peanuts dipped in taro sauce that sharpened the taste of alcohol. Ordinarily, an entertainer in this venue could not expect a cessation in the constant murmur of conversation. But gradually, the buzzing of competing voices died out. For now, at least, there was no distinction between merchant stable boys from Wolf's Paul, scholars serving girls from Han, low-level government clerks sneaking away from the office for the afternoon, laborers resting after a morning's honest work, Shopkeepers taking a break while their spouses watch the store. Maids and matrons out for errands and meeting friends. All were just members of an audience enthralled by the storyteller standing at the center of the tavern. He took a sip of foamy beer, put the mug down, slapped his hands a few times against his long, draping sleeves, and continued. The hegemon unsheath na aroena then. Uh, the hegemon is the title of Matazindu. Uh, the Achilles-like character from the last book. And King Mokri stepped back to admire the gray sword, the soul taker, the head remover, the hope dasher. Even the moon seemed to lose her luster next to the pure glow of this weapon. That is a beautiful blade, said King Mokri, champion of Gan. It surpasses other swords as Consort Mira excels all other women. The hegemon looked at Mokri contemptuously, his double pupils glinting. Do you praise the weapon because you think I hold an unfair advantage? Come, let us switch swords, and I have no doubt I will still defeat you. Not at all, said Mokri. I praise the weapon because I believe you know a warrior by his weapon of choice. 
What is better in life than to meet an opponent truly worthy of your skill? The hedgeman's face softened. I wish you had not rebelled, Mokri. In a corner, barely illuminated by the glow of the stove, two boys and a girl huddled around a table, dressed in hempen robes and tunics that were plain but well made. They appeared to be the children of farmers, or perhaps the servants of a well-to-do merchant's family. The older boy was about twelve, fair-skinned and well-proportioned. His eyes were gentle, and his dark hair, naturally curly, was tied into a single messy bun at the top of his head. Across the table from him was a girl about a year younger, also fair-skinned and curly-haired, and though she wore her hair loose and let the strands cascade around her pretty round face, the corners of her mouth were curled up in a slight smile as she scanned the room with lively eyes, shaped like the body of the graceful Dyron, taking everything with avid interest. Next to her was a younger boy about nine, whose complexion was darker and whose hair was straight and black. The older children sat on either side of him, keeping him penned between the table and the wall. The mischievous glint in his roaming eyes and his constant fidgeting offered a hint as to why. The similarity in the shapes of their features suggested they were siblings. "Isn't this great?" whispered the younger boy. "I bet Master Ruthy still thinks we're imprisoning our rooms, enduring our punishment." "Firo," said the older boy, a slight frown on his face. "You know this is only a temporary reprieve. Tonight." We each still have to write three essays about how Confucius morality applies to our misbehavior, and how youthful energy must be tempered by education, and how. Shh, the girl said. I'm trying to hear the storyteller. Now, don't lecture, Timu. You already agree that there's no difference between playing first and then studying, on the one hand, and studying first and then playing, on the other. This is called time shifting. I'm beginning to think that this time-shifting idea of yours would be better called time-wasting," said Timu, the older brother. "You and Firo were wrong to make jokes about Master Kamfiji, and I should have been more severe with you. You should accept your punishment gracefully. Oh, wait until you find out what Thera and I."、Mm. The girl had clamped a hand over the younger boy's mouth. "Let's not trouble Timu with too much knowledge, right?" Firo nodded, and Thera let go. The young boy wiped his mouth. "Your hand is salty too." Then he turned back to Timu, his older brother. Since you're so eager to write the essays, Toto Tika, I am happy to yield my share to you, so that you can write six instead of three. Your essays are much more to Master Ruthie's taste, anyway. Well, that's ridiculous. The only reason I agreed to sneak away with you and Thera is because, as the eldest, it's my responsibility to look after you. And you promised you would take your punishment later. Elder brother, I am shocked. Pharaoh put on a serious mien that looked like an exact copy of their strict tutors when he was about to launch into a scolding lecture. Is it not written in Sage Confucius' tales of filial devotion that the younger brother should offer the choicest specimens in a basket of plums to the elder brother as a token of his respect? Is it also not written that an elder brother should try to protect the younger brother from difficult tasks beyond his ability, since it is the duty of the stronger to defend the weaker? The essays are uncrackable nuts to me, but juicy plums to you. I am trying to live as a good moralist with my offer. I thought you would be pleased. That is, you you cannot. Timu was not as practiced at this particular subspecies of the art of debate as his younger brother. His face grew red, and he glared at Firo. If only you would direct your cleverness to actual schoolwork. You should be happy that Hudo Tika has done the sign reading for once," said Thera, who had been trying to maintain a straight face as the brothers argued. "Now, please be quiet, both of you. I want to hear the storyteller." The hegemon slammed Na Aroena down, and Mokri met it with his ironwood shield, ringing force with Kruban scales. It was as if Fithoweo had clashed his spear against Mount Kiji, or if Kana had slammed her fiery feast, fist against the surface of the sea. Better yet, let me chant for you a portrait of that fight. On this side, the champion of Gan, born and bred on wolf's paw. On that side, the hegemon of Dara, last scion of Kokrut's marshals. One is the pride of an island spear wielding multitudes; the other is Fithoweo, the god of war incarnate. Will the doubt ender end out doubt as to who is master of Dara, or will Gormal finally meet a blood meal he cannot swallow? Sword is met with sword, cudgel with shield. The ground quakes as do titans leap, smash, clash, and thump. For nine days and nine nights they fought on that desolate hill, and the gods of Dara gathered over the whale's way to judge the strength. 
of their will. As he chanted, the storyteller banged the coconut husk against the large kitchen spoon to simulate the sound of sword clanging against shield. He leapt about, whipping his long sleeves this way and that to conjure the martial dance of legendary heroes in the flickering firelight of the pub. As his voice rose and fell, urgent one moment, languorous the next, the audience was transported to another time and place. After nine days, both the hegemon and King Mokri were exhausted. After parrying another strike from the doubt ender, Mokri took a step back and stumbled over a rock. He fell. His shield and sword splayed out to the sides. With one more step, the hegemon would be able to bash in his skull or lop off his head. No! Firo couldn't help himself. Timu and Thera, equally absorbed by the tale, didn't shush him. The storyteller nodded appreciatively at the children and went on. But the hegemon stayed where he was and waited until Mokri climbed back up, sword and shield at the ready. Why did you not end it just now? asked Mokri, his breathing labored. Because the great man deserves to not have his life end by chance, said the hegemon, whose breathing was equally labored. The world may not be fair, but we must strive to make it so. Hegemon, said Mokri, I am both glad and sorry to have met you. And they rushed at each other again with lumbering steps and proud hearts. Now that was the manner of a real hero, whispered Firo, his tone full of admiration and longing. Hey, Timu and Thera, you've actually met the hegemon, haven't you? So that's the beginning of the Wall of Storms.